In just a few moments, we'll look at Hebrews chapter 11, but I just want to kind of give some preliminary thoughts. Uh, page 1, Roman number 1, the divine setting. Again, Isaiah 62, verses 6 to 7, a familiar passage in our midst. Uh, also referred to as the divine setting, and it's called the divine setting because the Lord says, I have said. In other words, this is uh, my initiative. This is my idea. This is my movement, my activity. I'm the one that is initiating this, and I'm the one that is going to bring it into its completion. And I believe that what the prophet Isaiah was speaking of is that something that's going to take place globally. And and even though we are 20 plus years in, and I think in many ways we're still at the beginnings of what the Lord is going to do in the earth insofar as setting watchmen on the wall, intercessors, singers, musicians, gatekeepers that will stand before the Lord, cry out to the Lord for the manifestation of his purposes in the earth and ultimately in the nation of Israel. And so, it's a, so the concept of night and day prayer is not just about the keeping of the schedule. Rather, I believe it is a response to the greatness and the majesty of God. I don't believe it is an accident that when the Lord spoke prophetically in 1983, that it was Psalm 27.4 in terms of the issue of beauty. Because in Psalm 145 verse 3, King David says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And again, what I believe he's saying there is that our praise or our worship is to be in response to the greatness of God. So the greatness of God is what fuels our worship, is what fuels our praise. And then he goes on to say, he says, and his greatness is unsearchable. And so because of his greatness is unsearchable or inexhaustible, it is only makes sense for the praise or the worship of him to be unending. And so when we're talking about nine-day prayer, it's not just about the keeping of a schedule. It is a response to the glory and the majesty of God. And so there's this, glo there's this global prayer movement, this global worship movement that is, being, uh, that is being released by the activity of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord says, I have set... In other words, I am taking responsibility for this, for its initiation, for its completion. I will, uh, I will take care of, uh, of the fact that, that it will be financed. I, I will take care of the relationship. I will take care of all the necessary components uh, for this divine setting to take place. Paragraph B, the, the Spirit is raising up a global uh, prayer movement in the church and I say specifically that it's in the church. It's not something that's alongside the church. It's not something that's outside the church. It is really the church becoming, uh, entering into more fully into her identity as the house of prayer. So it's a prayer movement within the church, and it's happening uh, globally. And I believe that the emerging, uh, growing prayer move uh, movement can serve as a prophetic indicator of what lies ahead. And so in, in many ways, I think that the prayer movement, because again, this has never happened in history, there have been prayer movements that have been local throughout history, but never has been a prayer movement that's been touching the whole earth. And I, I believe that it is, a, it, it is a prophetic indicator. It is a sign um, of the time. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about the book of Revelation is that there are probably about Eight, at least about 80 plus priestly references in the book of Revelation. In other words, worship, intercession is front and center of the book of Revelation because what is happening in the book of Revelation is we're seeing priestly activity or the prayers of the saints, God's activity in the heavenly temple, which again is a priestly location, and God's activity and the, and, the, and the priest activity together is that manifested on the earth insofar as God's end times activity uh, uh, in the nations. And so the, the prayer movement, I believe, is a prophetic indicator of what lies ahead in redemptive history pertaining to the Spirit's unique activity in the nations. And I got there in the notes, Isaiah 42, uh, 10 to 13, the, the new song being released and that stirring the heart of the Lord like a man of war, and he comes with power to return for his people. And of course, Revelation 5 8, the harp and bowl, the bowls being full of the prayers of, uh, uh, full of the prayers of the saints. And Revelation 8, where we see the prayers of the saints being mixed, I believe, with the prayers of the Lord, 
and some very powerful things are being manifested in the earth. In paragraph C, in the days of Daniel and Ezra, Daniel was shown a vision, and what happens there is uh, there, there is a, there's a fourfold stirring that happened in the days of Daniel and the days of Ezra, and I believe that those stirrings are happening again today. Uh, the first stirring, we see it in Daniel chapter 7, it is the stirring of the nations. This is a different uh, political, social, you know, good and bad, all the things are happening is because the spirit, the, uh, the divine activity of the four winds are stirring the nations of the earth, really as the Father is creating a context for his kingdom to be established on the earth forever. Ezra chapter 1, what we see there is we see that Cyrus got stirred by the spirit. And so Daniel, Daniel 7, we see the nation stirred. Ezra 1, we see Cyrus. In other words, we see the king's business leaders will be stirred by the spirit. Haggai chapter 1 and 13, we see the spiritual leaders and the people are being stirred to build the house of the Lord. And so the way I like to say it is that intercessors are being stirred to put their hands to the plow and to build the house of the Lord. And then uh, Ezra chapter 5 verse 1, is we see that the prophets are stirred. And so the nations are stirred, kings, business leaders are stirred, intercessors are stirred, the prophetic people are stirred by the Holy Spirit. And I believe, I believe that all of that is part of the setting that is taking place in the nations. Paragraph D, Jesus is raising up a worship movement in the spirit of the tabernacle of David. Now, in, um, there in paragraph E, you see that, uh, that King David had established 4,000 full-time paid musicians and singers. And so one of the things that we believe the Lord is doing, and, it, and he's doing it in our midst, but I believe he'll do it in other places in the earth, it is the, it is the establishing of the full-time occupational singer and musician. This is, not a, uh, uh, this is not a volunteer thing. This is a, our, our occupation. Now, we may, we may do it for a year. Some may do it for five years. Some may do it for longer. But in as much as you're engaged in this, this is your occupation uh, before the Lord. And I believe that it's a prophetic statement and a witness of the, that the fact that the Lord is going to be raising up this reality more in the nations. And I think that um, there's, there's more, more Holy Spirit understanding um, that is coming for us to understand why this is so important at this time in history, why this is so important here in Kansas City, and why this is going to be important in all other corners of the earth, this issue of God raising up the full-time occupational prophetic singer and musician. All right, let's go to page two. Page two. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, now we're going to look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11, again, a, it's a familiar passage. It's where the writer just gives a list of the heroes of the faith, men and women of faith who, who believed for the purposes of God um, in their generation. Some uh, believed in it and died without having received the promises, it says later on. And we see here in Hebrews 11, we see just different kinds of faith, so to speak. We see the faith of Abraham. Uh, we see the faith of Sarah. We see the faith of Moses. Uh, we see the faith of Daniel, the, the, the faith of Gideon, the faith of, Samuel, uh, excuse me, of Samson. We see different manifestations or different expressions of faith. And, and looking at each verse in Hebrews 11 really gives us, a, a, can really give us an insight into the kinds of faith that the Lord um, invites us to walk into. But the one I want to highlight uh, this evening is the faith of Noah. The faith of Noah. It, it was a very specific faith. It was a very specific movement of his heart towards the Lord. A very specific movement of his, of, uh, of his inner workings and the way that he related with the Lord and the way that he responded to the Lord in his generation. And here's what it says in verse 7. It says that by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. The Lord spoke things to Noah about things that had never happened in human history up until that time. 
And when he was warned of these things, it says that Noah was moved and Noah began to prepare and it was for the purpose of salvation in his generation. Paragraph A, Hebrews 11, again, it, it talks about the faith of the fathers that have gone before us. And one of the expressions of faith that can be easily overlooked is what I like to call the faith of Noah. And I think that the faith of Noah has some real relevance to us today because Jesus talks about the, the generation in which the Lord returns. He talks about it, uh, he describes it as the days of Noah. He describes the generation of his return as the days of Noah, and I believe that therefore it requires the faith of Noah. And what was the faith of Noah? The faith of Noah was that he actually believed God, that God was going to do something in human history that he had never, ever done before. In other words, God was going to do something unprecedented. God was going to do something unheard of. It was believed that prior to that warning that it had never rained in the earth before. The, uh, the belief was that the earth was watered from, from, uh, uh, from beneath. But this idea that water was uh, coming from the sky and that it would flood the earth, that was completely and entirely unheard of. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that God told Noah something that had never happened and Noah agreed with God. He believed God when he said, I'm gonna do something that has never, ever been done before. The faith of Noah, it, it is a faith that connects the believer with the unprecedented activity of the end times. When we're looking at the 150 chapters, for instance, we've been talking about for the last several years, if you look at them very closely, you realize that, or, or just the book of Revelation alone, it is unprecedented what these, what these passages are telling us. There's been a few hints here and there throughout history, but it is absolutely unprecedented. It is unheard of. And so it requires, I believe, the faith of Noah to believe God that he's going to do what he said he's going to do, even though it has never, ever happened before. The Lord spoke to Noah that he would do something that had been never done in, in redemptive history. What does it mean to have this faith? It means at least three things, that we come into agreement with what God says. Number one, number two, we engage him in regards to what he says. In other words, we, we talk to him about the, uh, the unprecedented information he's given us about the future. So we say yes to it, number one. Number two, we interact with him. And then number three, we respond to it. In other words, it begins to change the way that we think and feel in the way that we live. Because Hebrews 11, 7, 11, 7 tells us that Noah heard the warning of the things unseen, but that when he heard it, there were three things that happened. Number one, he, it, it moved him. It moved him with godly fear. Uh, the fear of the Lord was something that began to grow in his heart, began to grow in his mind, and began to grow, I believe, in his thinking. This, this fascinated trembling at the majesty and the glory and the power of God is the thing that began to touch the heart of Noah. And so as we look at the the, uh, the 150 chapters, uh, so to speak, it, it's, it's more than an intellectual exercise. It is to awaken faith, the faith of Noah within our hearts. It is to move us into godly fear, number one. And number two, the next thing that Noah did is as he began to prepare for that which God spoke to him about. It, it launched him into a preparatory response for his own life, for the life of his family, and for those that were around him. And then thirdly, the preparation was for the purpose of salvation, the faith of Noah. It takes faith, paragraph B, it takes faith to take hold of 
what the Lord spoke in these prophetic passages, these 150 chapters. The, the, the study alone is not enough. We must ask the Father uh, to touch our hearts and to release uh, 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 that, again, that faith of Noah. Now, some years ago, um, here at IHOP, he's probably going to shoot me for saying this, but that's okay. Um, you know, Mike went on this 30-day, some of you were here, he went on that, this 30-day fast. It was, he just kind of did his deal. And uh, he didn't really talk to a whole bunch of us for 30 days. And uh, after the 30 days, he sent out an email. He says, hey, I'm back. <laughs> you know, let's all meet over at the prayer room. And I'll never forget it. I mean, the prayer room was, I mean, it was packed because everyone was, you know, ready to hear, you know, what, you know, whatever the Lord spoke to him. And so he gets up there and he says, he literally says, he goes, I don't have a whole lot to say. I'm just miss you guys. <laughs> I, was like, I just want to say hi, you know. And uh, you remember that? He said, I just want to say hi, you know. And he's just talking, you know. And he says, yeah, you know, I was, I just been reading Daniel 7 to, to 12, you know, just for the last 30 days. And, and as he's talking about reading Daniel 7 to 12, uh, 12 for 30 days, he begins to weep. And I thought to myself, there's something to cry about in Daniel 7 to 12, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like it, 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 it struck me. I went, huh. Lions, tigers, and bears, and some like what is going on over here? And it wasn't, it, and it was a cry of affection and gratitude and whatever, all the good stuff for the Lord. But it was from reading Daniel seven to twelve, and I thought to myself, you know what? I don't know if that was supposed to happen, but that's the word that we want to engage with the subject of the end times in a way that it actually touches our heart. Because these passages, they are divine warnings about things unseen. And when Noah was divinely warned, it says he was moved. He was moved with godly fear. There was a trembling that entered into his spirit. There was an increased tenderizing that began to happen. Lots of things that can be said about the subject of this issue of godly fear. But it, it, it marked me, I went, wait a minute, there is, there is a... You know, there, it is very easy to, friends, you know, to look at Song of Solomon, for instance, and go, okay, that's the subject that I'm going to engage God with in terms of place of intimacy. But when it comes to the 150 chapters, I'm going to give myself to an intellectual exercise. No, we want to engage with the faith of Noah. Because when we engage with the faith of Noah, we are moved to godly fear. And we're moved to prepare, resulting in salvation. The faith of Noah, it helps us to move from mere end time data points to living understanding and perspective. Ephesians 1, 18, that where, where our, our understanding gets enlightened, where the light of God's word and the light of God's presence begins to touch our hearts, it begins to touch our minds, and we begin to get living understanding. By living understanding, I mean where, where again, Noah, he was moved with godly fear, and he prepared. In other words, he had understanding of, of how to live in light of this information that was given to him. Paragraph C, end time understanding without faith is just raw knowledge, and the apostle Paul tells us that the letter kills. That to engage with end time information without engaging with the Lord can actually produce a dullness where we're accumulating knowledge, but it's not causing the movement of the heart like what we see here in the faith of Noah. And so the faith of Noah, what it does, it, it's, the, it's the yes in our spirit. It, it activates our emotions where we get tenderized in an increased way, and it drives us into a transformative relationship with the Lord. And it gives us a sense of focus of how we ought to live. Paragraph D, the, the call tonight in a prayer, which is why we're talking about this, is in the context of the end time landscape. The story of the persistent widow, Jesus uh, tells the story of the persistent widow, and he ends the parable by, by, by asking a question. But when the son of man returns, will he find faith in the earth? It's a, it's a cryptic question if we look at that parable outside of his context. 
If we just look at the parable by itself, it's, it seems so random. Why would he be talking about nine-day prayer and justice and then ask this question? Now, how many of you know that when Jesus asks a question, somebody's about to go to school and it's not him? <laughs> so he's asking this question. Again, the faith of Noah engaging with the end time information where we receive the divine warning and we're moved to prepare. Paragraph F, the faith of Noah believes in the release of God's unprecedented activities, here it is, while living in times of relative normalcy and mundaneness. The faith of Noah is this faith where we believe, where the divine warnings become increasingly more real to us, even though everything around us tells us there's not really a whole lot going on. The, the example that I often think of is uh, the tragic events of September 11th. September 11th, 2002 or 2001, with the Trade Towers. How many of you remember that? Now, how many of you remember that September 10th was September 10th? It was just, just another day. Hey, bro, see you tomorrow. Kind of thing. It was a day like, like it's in the days of Noah. Marrying, giving to marrying. Um, as in the days of Lot, eating, drinking. I mean, just kind of like just the routine of life not knowing there was a whole other reality that was brewing that pretty much the entire earth was unaware of. The same thing with, uh, with COVID. You know, uh, there, you know, there was the day before COVID, so to speak. You know, we woke up in a non-COVID world and then we, we went to bed in a non-COVID world and woke up in a whole different world. It, it, where, where the rules begin to change and the, uh, uh, and the way that people relate began to change. The way that people think began to change. And so the faith of Noah, what it does, it, it increases our, uh, uh, I guess our sensitivity, if I can say this, our awareness of reality. That there's something else going on. John 3, 34, that the father so loved the son that he gave his son everything. There is this conversation that is taking place between the father and the son, and there's a conversation happening among the angels in Isaiah chapter 6. They're caught up in this dialogue. They're connected with a whole different reality about what God is up to and what God is going to release in the earth. And so the faith of Noah is this awareness through the word that connects us with that conversation that connects us with that reality where, we, where through the word we begin to see and perceive things that have not yet happened or have ever happened before or, 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 or have ever happened. And it begins to move our hearts. Paragraph F, so the mundaneness of life, because life is so routine, marrying, giving to marriage, eating, drinking, it requires the faith of Noah. That the Lord, we must ask the Father to begin to activate, to, to touch something inside of us with regards to the divine information that we're seeing in his word. And so it requires uh, the faith of Noah to stay connected with what is really going on, which is that the Father is stirring up the nations and he's preparing the earth for the unprecedented shaking and the release of God's glory, culminating in the inbreaking of his kingdom rule on the earth forever when his son returns. That's reality. That is what's going on. Paragraph G. It is important to note the context, again, of the parable of the persistent widow, that it is eschatological. It, it is in an end-time context. Jesus, he presents Luke 18.1, right after he prophesies about God's end time judgments that are described in detail in Ezekiel at 38 and 39. What happens in Luke 17 is Jesus talks about the days of Noah and the days of Lot 
and he talks about God's judgment that is coming. He says there'll be two men on the rooftop. He says one will be taken, one will remain. He says there'll be, you know, two ladies, they'll be in the field. One will be taken, one remains. And then to the apostles, they go, where? He goes, where are these people being taken? And Jesus says, he goes, where, he says, where the bodies are, he says, there's where the eagles will gather. And he's referring back to Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39. And then, of course, John the Beloved, he sees this, the reality with, with a whole other set of details in Revelation 19. And so after Jesus prophesies Ezekiel 38 and 39, or he points to Ezekiel 30 and 39, it, is, it says, Luke 81, then he told them this parable. This issue of persistent prayer that is connected with the awareness that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to happen. It is a thing that he divinely warns us of and we need the faith of Noah. And with the faith of Noah, it, it moves our heart in godly fear. It moves us to prepare. And one of the ways that we prepare is we begin to grow in this reality of persistent prayer, which is a personal thing, but, that, but for our context today, there is this corporate expression called nine-day prayer. But it's fueled and it's sustained by the issue of faith. And it, that is one of the reasons why Jesus asks this question. He, he talks about nine-day prayer. He talks about a persistent widow, this feisty old lady. She's hanging in there asking for justice. And then all of a sudden Jesus goes, ah, I got a question. Will I find faith when I return? And you're like, what's that, do, what's that got to do with anything? But when we take that passage and put it within its context, and we take away those very uninspired chapter headings, okay, never mind. <laughs> then you realize that, 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 that it's a singular thought, that nine-day prayer, here's the main first point, that one of the components of, that sustains us in nine-day prayer at this time of history as there are other prayer centers emerging in the nations of the earth, is having the faith of Noah, where for our vernacular, the 150 chapters of the end times become alive and they begin to move us with godly fear and to prepare for the purpose of salvation. So this mundaneness of life, the way that we go again through, you know, taking the kids to school, talking to our friends, working on our marriages, working on our jobs, paying our bills. I mean, just the routine and mundaneness of life. The Lord wants to give us something on the inside, and I call it the faith of Noah, where we, where we uh, believe and we lay hold of the things that we've been warned of, even though we have not yet seen them. Paragraph G, sorry, paragraph H, nine-day prayer has its personal and corporate expression. The context, again, of Luke 18, 1, shows us that this assignment is in part sustained, I believe, by what I, again, what I like to call the faith of Noah, which allows us to understand and have confidence in the unprecedented activity of the Holy Spirit at the end of the age. It requires faith. Let's go to page 3. What makes night and day prayer, nine day prayer, is the night watch. There, there is no night watch, night and day prayer without the night watch. Uh, it, it, it is very common to have early morning prayers, very common to have afternoon prayer, evening prayers. But this idea of prayer through the night, that is the thing that in fact, when most people hear about IHOP, and, they, and, they, and that's one of the things that actually catches them. They go, they go what? They're like, I can go there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's people in the room worshiping the Lord, crying out to God. I go, yeah. They're like, wow, that's interesting. That's the thing that alerts people. That is part of the miracle. That is part of the grace of God in our midst is to have this thing called the night watch. Without it, there is no nine-day prayer. Paragraph A but the strength and the development of the night watch belongs to the entire community 
that is hosting night and day prayer. And so the different communities in the earth that God is raising up that are, have the assignment to host night and day prayer in their midst, that assignment of, of night and day prayer, which is why I so appreciate uh, Isaac's uh, exhortation uh, earlier, that this assignment of nine day prayer, it belongs to a people. Now, not everyone in that people will do the night watch, but we all are called to own the assignment of nine day prayer, which again, is not possible without the night watch. It doesn't belong to the people who stand in the watches in the night alone, but it is, but it is an assignment that belongs to a people. Paragraph B, there's an entire psalm, Psalm 134, that is dedicated to the night watch. I think it is significant that the Lord, who is the author of scripture, that he would dedicate a chapter. It's three verses, but he dedicates a chapter entirely to this issue called the night watch. Now, it's believed that this uh, psalm, Psalm 134, it is believed by some that it was a song that was sung by the daytime in order to strengthen the night watch. So it was a song from the day watchers to the night watchers. Because again, it is, it is an assignment that is owned by a people. The Night Watch, I had the, the privilege of doing it for a good bit. And one of the things that I learned is that the Night Watch is a call to interdependence. It's where the Lord issues his strength through the community that you're a part of, which is what I believe is partly meant in Psalm 134, verse three, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. It, it, it comes from the community of the saints, the context of the relationship, the leadership that you're under, the leadership that you're with, that the blessing of the Lord comes through Zion. It comes out of Zion. Again, uh, there's many... Um, implications to that in many ways to kind of unpack that. But again, for our purpose today, that the night watch is a call to inter interdependence. It, it cannot be sustained uh, long-term without the ownership of the people, of the manifestation of the grace of God in our lives. In my particular case, the, the grace of God manifested in terms of God's grace just upon my heart and, and upon my spirit to do for 20 years. And but that's not the only manifestation of God's grace. The other manifestation of God's grace was my wife. Just her continual support and encouragement. In fact, there were three very specific occasions in, in, in this journey where I was like, wait a minute, what's going on over here? And she was like, hey, no, dude, <laughs> get back there. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Okay. <laughs> you could, I could interpret that all kinds of ways. But anyway, <laughs> no, but no, the grace of God in my life was was my wife, uh, my family, my immediate family. Uh, Mike was a significant manifestation of God's grace in my life in terms of ask the, the leader of IHOP to hey, say, you know, stay the course. Ed Hackett, all the time she pulls you in with, you know, that old little Shonda Mahondi there. <laughs> Kirk Bennett. No, <laughs> no, Kirk Bennett. Dave Slyker, I'm looking at it right now. I mean, just, and I want to go into all the stuff because I'm, I'm going to, you know, start getting all teary-eyed, but but the way that he has postured himself over the years in terms of making my life work and just to, I mean, we've talked about this. And so, but all that is part of the manifestation of the grace of God. The, uh, uh, the, the community that we're a part of. And so what we see here in, that, in, in Psalm 134 is we see that the daytime is prophesying uh, to the night watch that, hey, stay the course, keep the charge. And... Um, and so, I'm going to tell you right now, please don't prophesy people off the night watch. <laughs> Just stop it. Just please. 
you know, if, if, I, if I had a dime for every time someone says, I feel like the Lord's got more for you. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, are you aware of what you just said? I finally just had enough of one person came to me and said, it was a friend of mine, he said, hey, I feel like the Lord's got more of you. I said, you know what, the thought of that just absolutely nauseates me. <laughs> we want to we wanna operate in the opposite way, in strengthening people to be on the wall. I want to ask our leaders across the base, if you got someone that is on the night or wants to do the night, move heaven and earth for them to be on the night and still be able to serve the area that they're a part of. There has to be a way. Again, I want, I, I'll say a little stronger. I want to charge us as a leadership team to do that. Keep the person on the night watch and begin asking for creative ideas of how to build the night watch and still strengthen the administra administrative area in which they are working. We really can walk and chew gum at the same time when it comes to this. <laughs> Paragraph C, Matthew 25, verse 6. We know the passage. At midnight a cry is heard. The bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. The night watch or the night watches that are emerging, which, which to me, when I say night watches, I'm saying it is the whole night and day expression that is emerging in the earth. The night watches, they are a witness from the Lord to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. It is indicating that we're living in a time that the bridegroom is up to something, that a bridegroom is about to release unprecedented activities in the nations. There are at least three components. There's more, but there's at least three components of this issue of the night, this midnight cry that I want to highlight. That when these things happen, there are indicators that the bridegroom is about to do something. He's about to release his activity in a significant way. Number one, the midnight cry can speak of the end of human history. In Romans chapter 13, verse 12, the apostle Paul, he refers as the end of human history as the night. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent. And the day is at hand, the day referring to uh, 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 the age to come, where the full manifestation of God's glory is released. And the, the night watch, I believe, is, is, a, is a witness of that reality, of a people in the dark, of being a prophecy of an entire generation in the darkest night of history, contending for the inbreaking of God's light and God's glory. And so Paul refers to the end of history as the night and the coming days as the inbreaking of the next age. The presence of the night watch points to the cry emerging at the end of natural history and a call to cast off all works of darkness and come into full agreement with the truth. Paragraph E. Again, I'm talking about night and day prayer being a witness. What is happening in our midst, it, it, we're not strong, smart, or capable enough to do what we've been doing for the last 23 years, except by the grace of God, because God is raising up a witness. There's lots of things he is saying about this night and day prayer reality. One of the things he's saying, he says, my greatness is unsearchable. This is the only reasonable response to my inexhaustible glory. Number one, number two, one of the witnesses says that one of the things he's testifying of is that the bridegroom is coming in the dark night of history and the age, and the, uh, and the age to come is upon us. The day is at hand, Romans 13, 12. Paragraph E, the night points to the night of judgment. The night of judgment, the prophet Isaiah he refers to God's global end time judgment as well as his judgment specifically against Babylon. He refers to it as the night. The night watch is a picture of the end time church longing for the Lord and inquiring concerning the time of great shaking. Isaiah 21, you got to have it right there in the notes. Watchmen, what of the night? They're asking the question about the release of God's end time judgment. 
watchman, what of the night? And then the verse ends by saying, if you will inquire, inquire. That when night and day prayer is emerging in the nations, is one of the ways of God saying, Church of Jesus Christ, it is time to inquire concerning the night. My end time shakings and my end time judgments. Isaiah 26, verse 9. With my soul, I've desired you in the night. He's talking about the night of judgment. I will seek you early for when your judgments are in the earth. The inhabitants learn. Paragraph F. Matthew 25, verse 6. The midnight cry also plain, uh, speak plainly of the night hours. Just plainly of the night hours. In the, the different uh, monastic movements throughout history, the night watchmen, they actually saw themselves as being up all night looking for the return of the Lord. That is part of what they understood their assignment was, was to sometimes they would be in these really cold creeks so they would not fall asleep. But through the night, they would, be, they would read the Psalms. They were taking Matt Candler's class. They were reading the Psalms and they were anticipating the return of the Lord. They, were, they literally were looking for the Lord to come back. And that is why I started with this issue of the faith of Noah, that, that part of the thing that sustains this gloriously rigorous assignment called nine-day prayer is the faith of Noah, of us being connected with what the Scripture has to tell us about the future as it pertains to the generation of the Lord's return. So the different monastic movements, the night watchmen, they saw themselves as being up in the night, looking for the coming of the Lord. In other words, there is an eschatological expectation associated with the night. It prophesies to us about God's eschatological purposes. Again, this glorious assignment of nine-day prayer is more than just, oh, wow, this is cool that you guys are doing that. No, the Lord is shouting something. I really believe this. And that's why I said, for those of ears to hear and eyes to see, the Lord is shouting something to the church, to the nations, through the popping up of these night and day prayer centers in the nations of the earth. Paragraph G, the night watch, Psalm 57, verse 8. It awakens the dawn. David talks about, he says, I will awaken the dawn. The morning, when the natural sun comes up. Beloved, it is a prophecy. I'm going to say this again. Every morning, when the natural sun comes up, it is a prophecy. The sun was given for more than just giving some of you a suntan. I got mine taken care of. <laughs> but, but, okay. <laughs> oh, hold on a second. I need to get some water here. That just made me thirsty. <laughs> no, remember Genesis tells us that the sun and the stars, they were created as signs uh, to speak to us. Every morning when the sun comes up, it is a prophecy. It is a prophecy that this age will end and a new day will come. It is a prophecy, according to Psalm 19, because the sun, when David looked at the sun, he didn't just see the sun, he saw the heart of the bridegroom. He says in Psalm 19, he says that, that the sun is like the bridegroom coming out of his chambers. And I think that part of what David was, was, was speaking of was the bridegroom coming out of his chambers as it pertains to his second coming. And it says that when he comes, it says that, that his rising will be for one end of the heaven to another, which is very similar to, similar to what we see Jesus prophesy in Matthew chapter 13, when he comes and the angels go from one end, to the, from one end of the heavens to the other, begin to gather the saints. It is the bridegroom who's coming with the, with the zeal of his heart, 
uh, a deep passion for his people, and he completes his circuit from one end of the heaven to another. And so the group of people that do the night watch, it's their greet every day in worship, prayer, the greeting, the coming of the new day. Speaking of the fact that there is a generation that will be in the deep night of history. And through worship, intercession, agreement with God, would welcome and usher in the coming of the new day. It also points, Isaiah, Psalm 46, verse 5. It also points to what the psalmist calls the break of dawn. Just at the break of dawn when God will deliver Israel from the oppression of the Antichrist. The break of dawn. Psalm 110 verse 3 calls the late time of human history, calls it the womb of the morning. Again, all of this language of the night of history and the inbreaking of a new day and the night and day prayer reality and worship, and in this context, the night watch, the glory of it is that it prophesies, it speaks of that reality. It points us towards that. Some of you are going, are you making this stuff up? Well, if I am, it kept me going for 23 years, so there you have it. David goes on to say in verse six, he says, it's rising for one end of the heaven and it's circuit to the other end. And here it is. And there is nothing hidden from his heat. Beloved, when the bridegroom comes, nothing will escape his heat. Nothing will escape his zeal and his fierce passion for his bride. And it will either be a very positive experience for those who said yes to him or it will be a great day of destruction for those who resist him. Amen? 